Goodman is an award-winning artist who paints exclusively with a palette knife to create her oil paintings because of the thick and expressive strokes of color she can create with it. Anne holds a fine arts degree from Miami University of Ohio and has worked as a professional graphic designer in Boston for over 30 years. She began painting steadily in oil again in 2007 after taking a palette knife workshop and was immediately hooked. Her work is currently represented by the Red Inn in Provincetown and the Artist Studio and Gallery at Patriot Place in Foxborough. Anne lives in Walpole and is a member of the Foxborough Art Association. You can view portfolios of her work and keep up to date with her most recent paintings by visiting her website at anngorbett.myportfolio.com and her blog, anngorbett.blogspot.com, or by following her on Facebook or Instagram. Let's welcome Anne, and we look forward to your demo. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Can everybody hear me okay? I hope. Nod your heads. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Marjorie, for asking me to do a demo today. So uh, I don't know if, if how many of you were members, have been members of Franklin for a while. I did do a demo for you. I think it was probably five or six years ago now. Um, I had done a demo of a building in uh, Boston, a scene of Boston, uh, the public garden. Um, and so I was trying to think about what subject matter I wanted to paint today. And I was thinking back on the ones I've done for demos already. I've done landscapes, uh, Boston buildings, I've done flowers, and I don't think I'd ever done animals. So I, I have been on this animal kick for a while, <laughs> for the last couple of weeks, doing everything from black labs, golden retrievers, foxes, owls, uh, cats. So, um, and they are so much fun to paint with a palette knife, as you can imagine, because of the fur and the texture and the birds especially have the wonderful feathers. Um, and also, I just wanted to mention that last weekend, my husband and I went to the, um, the Museum of American Bird Art in Canton. And I don't know how many of you have been there, but it is a really cool place. So I highly recommend you go there. There was an exhibit of David Allen Sibley's uh, paintings of birds, and they're really, really amazing. Um, and he has a lot of little, um, he done, he's done a ton of research on birds and he has a little tidbit about each bird um, next to his work. So it might be ending this weekend. So if you can get there before it leaves, please do. Anyway, so once I saw that, I was like, okay, yes, I'm gonna do an owl today. So um, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about my supplies, what I use before I get into painting, just, um, just to give you an overview. And if any of you have questions as I go along, feel free to unmute yourself and ask me a question if you want clarification on anything, or if maybe you wanna see something up closer, I can see if I can move the camera a little bit closer. But I do believe there is a Q&A session at the end too. So, um, but I'm comfortable with either way if you wanna jump in and ask me a question. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna go over what I have uh, here. When I start to painting, I um, almost always print out, have the image printed out at the size I'm gonna paint it. Um, I did get this image from a site called unsplash.com. And what's great about that is it's all copyright free images. And um, so you can download them and, and use them have how, you know, however you want. And there are some really great images there. I'm, I was surprised. Uh, that they're copyright free, but um, so I, that's where I, I have found a lot of my animal pictures because as you can imagine, it's hard to get good shots. Marjorie, maybe you and <laughs> maybe you would be able to do that. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I saw this owl and I think I confirmed that it's a great horned owl, but those of you who are birders can, can dispute me on that. I believe it's a great horned owl. Um, these are not his ears. They're actually his, um, they're just tufted, uh, 
things. I saw David Allen, Allen, David Allen simply had a version of this where his tufts were sticking up, but this one, um, his, his tufts are down. I loved the color of his eyes. Um, and I loved the, the different colors I can see in the fur. So he is my subject for today. So um, I also also have almost always have the image downloaded to my iPad. And those of you that use iPad as a reference know that the, the colors of a color printout are not always as vibrant as you can see on the iPad. So but I also have him here on my iPad. And the obvious advantage of having it on the iPad is I can zoom in you know, to the little parts of the painting that I wanna focus on, for instance, the eyes. And then I wanted to kind of show you the um, preferred surface that I use. Um, this is called a cradle board. Many of you probably might use them for your own work. Um, this one, I believe I got at Jerry's Artorama, but Blick has them. There's a company called Ampersand that makes some really high quality ones and some unique sizes, which I like. Um, I also also do a ground cover almost always in this orange tone, and this is an acrylic. It's the one time I do use a brush. <laughs> um, I just mix a combination of cad, red, yellow, orange until I get the color I like. And the the advantage to me of of doing this is it's it's kind of a mid tone. It's not it's not white. It's not black. It's kind of in the middle. And I think when you start applying your colors, it, it helps you to sort of judge your values better. I also like, in the end, I'm not, I'm not totally covering up this orange in every single spot. And I like the way that orange kind of comes through sometimes when the painting's done. And then um, I think it helps to also give a cohesion to the painting overall. And then, I wanted to show you my arsenal of palette knives. I do have several different sizes. <laughs> the one, those of you who have been to Patriot Place, you saw I did a huge painting of Boston. Those were mainly, mainly done with these over here. Today, I'll be using mostly the, this size over here. Um, I have all different brands. I don't, there's not like a certain brand I like. There's certain ones I use a lot. I use this size a lot. Um, I like that it has a, a sharp, um, is it, maybe you can see it better over there, a sharp edge to it. It's not rounded. It has like these sharp edges to it. Um, so I have that one and then I use this one a lot. And this one. So I'm gonna pull out the ones I think I'm gonna be using today. And maybe this one. This one has a nice point to it on the end if I wanna get like just a dab of something. So those are the ones I'm going to use today. So I'm going to pull those out. And then I just, one other thing about the orange ground is when, I'm, when the painting is done, while the painting is still wet, this, these, I use these to sign my name. And these are called um, wipeout tools. So you can kind of see it's got rubber tips on the end. And so at the end, when I go to sign my name, this will lift up the paint. It's almost like it's, um, removing the paint where it is. And then the orange will show through and that will be my signature. So I'll do my initials and then the orange will show through. So that's the other advantage of using the orange <laughs> as the backdrop. And then one other thing I just uh, wanted to mention is I often use, especially for animals, it's very important that to get the eyes in the right place and the the beak or the snout in the right place. So um, in this case, I used um, transfer paper and I got this at Flick. Serral transfer paper comes in all different colors. This is a, a one that looks like a pencil, it's graphite color. So you can cut it to whatever size you want. And um, so then the other advantage of having the printout at the size I want is I'll put this underneath and then I just make sure to get those eyes and everything in the right place. And this becomes my template then to guide me through the painting.
And then the other thing, I do have all my colors set up here on my palette. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the colors that I use. Obviously it's not a limited palette. <laughs> I have a lot of colors. Um, this palette I'm using now is a glass palette that's um, clipped to a board. And the reason I do that is so that it will fit in this uh, Masterson Stay Wet. Uh, you, a lot of you may have one of these. So I can keep the colors, you know, dry for a, at least a little while, but then the palette kind of drops in there and it stays uh, fresh for a couple days. So that's my palette. And then I also just wanted to mention a couple of um, impasto mediums that I use. Uh, this one, I think I'm gonna use this one today. This is called Liquin, Liquin Impasto. And this one makes the paint dry really fast. So for instance, if I'm doing a commission or something and I need it to dry really fast, I'll use this one um, because It'll be, depending on how thick I've painted, by the next day, it'll be dry to the touch. That's how fast it dries. This is another one I use if I want it to dry a little slower. If I'm working on something where I know I need to go back in, in a, you know, for several days and rework some areas, this will keep it wet for at least a few days. The disadvantage is then the whole painting won't dry for at least a couple of weeks. It'll take a long time for it to dry. So I have to make a decision. I like to use an impasto medium and I have to make a decision when I start whether I want it to dry fast because it because of my paint is so thick and I like to work wet into wet. If I use this one and I try to rework something the next day it's not going to work. I would have to probably scrape it off and start over. So um, but I'm going to use the other disadvantage of this one. It's a little smelly. <laughs> The other one doesn't smell at all. This one's a little smelly, um, but I'm gonna use this one today. So I'm gonna put a big glob of that on my palette. And then um, as I'm mixing a color, if I get enough of the color and I like it, I'll add the impasto medium, medium to that. And then it kind of extends the color. So I get a little bit more for my money. All right, so, um, I'm gonna get started here. I don't see any questions coming in. So hopefully everybody can see I'm left-handed. So I'm gonna be probably going like this. So I kind of set it up that way. So you hopefully see, I also have very thick hair. So that's why I put it, <laughs> I put it in ponytails. So my hair hopefully won't get in the way. Um, all right, so these are my knives. I like to start mixing with my favorite, which is this one right here. So when I do an animal, I almost always start with the eyes because I think that's the most, it's the most important thing to me. And then I'll kind of work out from there. I'll do the eyes first, then usually the nose, make sure those are looking good. And then I can kind of work out from there. And then as I get to some of the feathers, I can really have some fun with the knife trying different. Uh, looks like somebody had a question there. Let's see. Chat? Just a random comment. Sorry. Oh, I guess it's a good thing. It isn't smell a vision. Yes. <laughs> and you're using oil based medium? Is yes, I am. Thank you for asking. Yep. Uh, these are all oil, oil colors. Uh, different brands, um, as you know, different brands have different, like you can buy the same color in two different brands and they look completely different. So I kind of test around different brands and see um, which ones I like. So um, I am gonna start by painting these gorgeous eyes. I'm gonna zoom in on my, my owl's eyeballs over here. Can you see that iPad okay? Maybe it doesn't matter. Okay, so um, I am gonna start by trying to mix that beautiful gold yellow color. I kind of feel like Bob Ross right now, doesn't he? <laughs> I'm gonna mix some happy little eyes.
Somebody's at the door. <laughs> Somebody must have heard there's a pallet knife demo going on. <laughs> they will look over to my. <laughs> The other advantage of palette knife painting is um, I don't use a solvent of any kind. So then just to clean my knife, I just use a tissue. And the reason I use tissue versus a paper towel is I find it's, um, it's a little easier to manipulate. And it, I don't know, I just, and then you just throw it away. It's a little less wasteful, I think. I don't know. But I, I just like the, the feel of the tissues better. And, Okay, so I see a couple of different colors in here. There's a really bright yellow. And then right around the um, pupil, I guess that is, it looks a little green. So another strategy I like to do is mix a bunch of colors that I know I'm gonna use ahead of time. And then I don't have to stop and go back and mix. I can kind of um, do sort of the mixing. Sometimes I do the little bit of mixing right on the picture itself. So I'll mix at least at least three or four, sometimes more um, colors ahead of time so that I can have them ready to go. That green looks a little bright, so I'm going to dull it down with the opposite, which is reddish orange. And the last time I did a demo for a uh, fox sparrow, everybody was kind of surprised that they think that I use a lot of paint. And it really, I don't know why, it really isn't. I guess maybe I'm a little more economical with my strokes. I'm not sure why, but um, you know, people always think if you're using palette knife, you use, you just must go through a ton of paint. And I really don't. Um, Okay, and then that pupil is going to be real dark. And while I do have black on my palette, I very rarely use colors right out of the tube by themselves. I always like, if I want a dark, I'll mix almost all the darks I have on my palette, I'll mix it. I, can, I think it gives it a little more um, interest. Get some impasto medium. Okay, so I've got my darkest dark I'm going to use for the pupil and also right around his eyes that looks very on the purpley side to me so I'm gonna mix a little more of the purple color here and then I'm gonna mix one more Kind of an orangey red color that's right around the edge there. Okay, that's enough mixing. I'm going to get started. Now, I think to this knife might be okay, but I think I'm going to switch to a smaller one. So I'm going to switch to, to this size right here. I think for the eyes, I think that'll be a little better fit. So I'm going to start with this yellowy color. And I, um, I think I'm going to tighten this in here so I don't fall off. it in there for me. Um, I try to use an economy of stroke. Um, I think I've noticed when I teach palette knife classes that it's a tendency to kind of want to keep going over things over and over and over again and I like to do it in as few strokes as I can. I think it gives it in the end a little bit of a fresher feel. So in order to make a circle I'm going to do a bunch of a variety of strokes kind of going around the eye. Like 
so. So I'm doing just little strokes so I can have the appearance of the the semicircle. And I, while I'm going, I'm actually going outside the lines, which is fine because um, the advantage of the palette knife is you can come back in with your next color and sort of help correct correct the lines. Okay, I'm going to take this brighter orange color. And I'm going to go around the edge. Hope I'm not blocking the canvas. Okay, and then this. Um, this little uh, kind of a dark green edge. We'll do that next. Kind of exaggerating that a little bit. Okay, now I'm going to put in that that dark dark of the pupil. So now you can see I I went a little too much with my pupil there, so I'm going to clean it up by coming in with the knife and just scraping in on that. And then fixing it. Okay, so now I'm going to um, I'm still working my way around the eye. There's a very dark area right around the outside of the. Oh, one more thing I want to do before I go before I move on. These highlights on the eye I think are kind of important, so I might try to put those in now. Soften that little um, that little glint in the animal's eye that kind of makes it come alive. In this case, it, I think it's reflecting the blue sky, so I'm going to make it not completely white, but just a very pale blue, purple. Try to do this very, with one stroke. Uh, maybe two. <laughs> okay. okay, so now I'll come in around the eye. Work my way around with small strokes. I have to get over here for a second. Block it in.
It's like the Cheshire cat when he appears. All you see is his eyes first. <laughs> That's right. A little clean up here. Okay. So now I think I might go down to his, uh, get his beak in here. Beak is not, it looks a little on the purple side, but that highlight is kind of important to get the, the impression that it's coming forward. And when you get the beak done, could you perhaps move the camera closer so we could see the detail and what you've done with the eye and the, the beak? Sure, I um, do my best. Do you want to move it? Yeah, let me just finish this speak here. I have a camera assistant behind me. <laughs> if we were live, we'd be poking up behind you so we could get a closer view. Thanks. It does look a little scary right now with just his eyes on. Move it in. Is the chair in the way? No, it's fine. Let's see how close you can get. Can you see how it looks? I think he wanted to just go in like real close just to see it, right? Is that right? Yeah, just I think if you can, just so we can. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And that's really, that's great. If you could stay in. Oh, yeah? Just Good. keep it there? Yeah, because I really would love to see what's happening as you make the mark. Okay. Yeah. We'll give that a try. Thank you. Magic, Chris. It's magic. It's lovely. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I am going to um, I think I'm going to start working on the tufts up here and start working on some of the, the feathers that are coming out. So I'm moving to my bigger palette knife, this one. And I think I might start with the darks. So I'm going to mix a nice dark for those ears, or shouldn't say ears. Since it's the great horned owl, I guess they're horns, maybe. So that's about, can you, I don't know if you can see that. I'll try to show you how much paint I have on my knife there. That's great. Kind of like sort of on the edge a little bit. So I'm trying to also, as I make my marks, to imitate how I see the feathers are going. So these are kind of coming out of his head. So that's how I want to try to make my marks. And 
there's a little trail of black here. I don't know if you can see my iPad anymore, but there's a little trail of black that goes to his eyes, which I think is important. So. A little black in there, a little black in here. So when I look on the photo on the iPad, I can see much more color than I can see in the color printout. There's a little bit of like some yellow going on over here. A little hint of like pinks and red up on this top. So I think I'm gonna mix a bunch of different colors. And they're kind of on the light side. So I'm starting with white. I'm gonna add a little of my yellow ochre, I think, to get one color. Sometimes I'll also, um, as I'm mixing a color, I'll hold it up to my reference to kind of see how close I am. It's almost always too bright, so I have to dull it down a little bit. Do you prefer to mix on the palette or do you ever mix on the board as you're painting? For the most part, I mix on the palette, but um, but I do like how the color, like when I start putting this on here, it'll start mixing with the black. And I kind of like the way that looks and it, um, I think it creates an interesting texture and feel. All right, I'm going to add a little pink. And then there's also a pretty brown color. I'm gonna get at least three colors here so I can start working them together. Plus this, there's a lot of darks up here on his head. So I wanna have enough uh, dark color to come in on that. Little intermission here while I try to get my colors mixed up. Okay, now I want to get some, get some more black, more black starks, mixing black, a little Prussian blue, a little ultra blue, dioxazine purple. And a little burnt umber. Okay. Oh, there is kind of a nice gray there too. So I'm going to try to get that color mixed in here. The gray brown. Got kind of that much on my palette right now, my palette knife. All right, so I might come start from his eyes and kind of move out. So I see these feathers right here kind of curving around the eye. So I'm going to try to replicate that with my knife by curving around the eye. 
And some of that dark color is coming in as I'm making the strokes and I, I like the way that looks, so I'm just gonna leave it. Now I'm gonna do this side. That's kind of cool. Oops. Timber. Tighten up the easel. There we go. Okay, and I'm going to come in with a different color. I'm going to try this brownish. Color. Oops, a little dark on there. And I see this coming in on the side. I'll define the edge. This is probably a little too yellow and bright, but I can always go over it with another color. And the feathers are very layered one on top of another. So I'll probably come in here, do several layers. The other thing I want to make sure to do before this dries too much is when I start building in my background, I'm going to want to soften the edge um, where the owl is sitting on top of the background. So what I'll do at the very end is after I paint in the background, I'll come back to the edge of the bird and just softly sort of feather with the knife like this along the edge. So it'll just feather nicely on top of the background. You won't, you can't really see that now because there's no background color, but. I see a little bit of tufting of a lighter color on top of this uh, tops here. So I'm gonna come in with a lighter color and try to get that feel. Same over here. Oops. So I kind of well, took a little bit too much of that dark there, but go in and correct that a little bit.
I'm still just kind of trying to follow the way I see the feathers going. Here they're kind of going away from his eyes. I'm trying to replicate that with my knife strokes. And then I'm gonna see, let's see. This is a little tricky here, these dark, these dark areas. So I might just, so I've got a little dark on the edge, very tip of my knife here. And I'm just gonna kind of come in and sort of scatter some darks to make that pattern. And I'm really, I'm like almost sort of hovering on top of the other color because it's so thick on my knife. If I just kind of hover on top of the other color, I'm sort of, I'm depositing darks on top of that base to help try to replicate this pattern that's going on up here. And it gets a little lighter as it gets towards his beak. So it's lighter and smaller. Okay. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna try to get more of this area. This feel around his eyes, I think is kind of key to the way this owl looks. Now the lighter part is gonna be down here with his feathers and over here. So I guess I don't wanna to get too bright, but maybe I'll Put in some of the brights, I see. Now these feathers right here look kind of thin. So I'm, I'm trying to replicate that with my knife strokes. Now it's kind of going around his beak like that. Same over here. Some of them are actually kind of going over his beak. Okay. Some of these look a little, well, maybe I should try to get this over here. Probably because of the lighting. This area of his face is a little, it's not as bright over here, but I still want that delineation around his eye, that round thing around his eye. It's probably important for the identifying this bird, this owl here. Um, there's a nice little highlight right above his eye there. I think I want to try to get that in. Dan. Yes. I would imagine another uh, good audience for you, um, I'm just thinking, would be uh, birders, you know, like yeah. birders. Because as you put each one of these feathers in, I think they would be you know, more and more fascinated as this is becoming the bird they love so much. <laughs> That's think, a great idea. Yeah, I think they would love this. 
Maybe I'll talk. Uh, they, you know, and they they are so knowledgeable. I, I think they would they would just really appreciate how you can actually bring their their feathered friends to life. This is amazing. That's a great idea. Maybe I'll talk to that uh, museum of bird art I was mentioning. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Any you know anything affiliated like that? I think that would be uh, an area for you because it, I think they'd love that. And yeah. I, you know things like uh, foxes and things like that too, with the long fur. That was yeah. cool. Yeah, I did a little fox recently. He was very fun. Oh yeah. With our build your own zoo project, I think a lot of us have animals on our minds anyway. This would be a great addition to that. Yes, that's true. Thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, <laughs> I was just thinking about it. There's so many colors in this bird, if you could see the picture. I should have sent the picture out ahead of time so you could see all the beautiful colors he has in his face. Mm. So this, this could be an interesting thing here. So this, there's some, while he's got light feathers in here, there's some dark, uh, very thin strands that are coming over his face that I could try. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this. I just do a little, little wisps. I'm just barely touching the surface. And you probably need to get this part of his nose in here. Finish off his beak. Dark. And then there's kind of a light color that meets up with the beak. And then there's some feather tufts coming out here. And some feather tufts coming out there. Just realized I lost my darts coming down to the eye here. I'll put those back in. Let's see, how are we doing on time? It's 7.35, right? Someone let me know when you'd like to stop and do your Q&A.
Let me get a little bit of a brighter, lighter value here. Kind of accentuate that beak. My iPad, it looks a little on the blue cast. And about another 10 minutes or so, and then we can start the Q and A. You can okay. keep painting, you can keep painting while people are asking questions if you want. Okay. So one other thing I do try to do is try to keep it fairly thin. You know, palette knife does have a thick texture to it but fairly thin until I get to those final fine tuning details. And then I'll, then I'll really grab like a big thick glob of paint and lay it in there. But until I kind of feel like I got the, the shapes and everything the way I want them, it is fairly thin. And then I'm gonna build up to the, I like to have a couple of um, really thick strokes there at the very end to make the painting come alive. This is looking a little kind of flat to me right here. It's a little too much of a harsh edge. So I wanna introduce another value in there. Help soften that. Another technique I've used in the past is um, sometimes I'll like, it, especially in backgrounds, I'll just put like a bunch of colors down and then I end up scraping it all off. And it really leaves the really cool texture because some of it's the orange showing through, the colors are kind of mixing together. I've done that a few times. It, it ends up kind of cool because I don't. Often when I'm doing animals like this, I want the animal obviously to be the focus and to have the most texture. So I want the background to kind of sit back a little bit. And so if I if I just kind of you know put a bunch of colors, in this case, I'll try to pick up these green colors in the background and then just scrape it off. And it really kind of leaves a, a nice um, mix of colors in the background, but the really the thick texture will remain on the owl himself or herself. I'm not sure if this is a male or female. If I was at the museum, they'd probably be able to tell me. So here is a little bit of a dark edge uh, right around that semicircle. And are, are there names to the different styles of palette knives? Like, you know, on brushes we have round and filbert and flat and that. Um, if we were looking for a particular palette knife, which kind do you use? Or is there any particular brand that you like? You know, as that would be a good thing for them to do that. But as far as I know, they don't. They're often numbered, um, but I find the numbering isn't consistent. Like um, if I ordered a number 11 Liquitex one, it would be different than the number 11 I bought through Blick. Um, when, oh. I, when I first started, Blick had um, a variety of, you could buy like a five pack, and it had a variety of different sizes and shapes. So I bought one of those just to kind of see which ones I liked the best. And then since then, um, you know, I've just been, if I see a, a unique one, I usually don't get the real funky ones, the ones that have like the rippled edge or anything like that. I usually just like to have a, a nice clean edge. Um, I, I, the first brand I bought had like a rubber, uh, 
a rubber grip and I tend to like now kind of like these wood, the wood grips better. Um, Liquitex has a, their, their handle looks something like that. But, so is uh, this, the size more important than, than the shape necessarily? Or? Um, kind of, I tend to like, like this is one of the, my more recent purchases. <laughs> Um, I tend to really like having a flat edge to it, as opposed to, if you look at this one right here, it's got a round. If you look at these, let's look at these two together. Oh, yeah. yeah. See how one has a sharp corner and the other one has a round corner? I tend to lean more towards the sharp corners, because then you can, you can take that edge and really like slice it. You know, you can really make very thin and it's predictable too, like where the paint will stop. I know the paint's going to end right where that corner is. Whereas this one, it's a, it, because it's rounded, it's a little harder to predict that. This one, I know that I can put the paint on here and the paint will end right where that edge bends. So that's what I'll tend to do. I don't know if that answers your question, but. <laughs> Yep, thank you. This was my very first palette knife. I used it for everything. I think it was a Blick. This has got such a sharp edge on it. I can cut paper with it <laughs> because I've used it so much. It's like been thinning out on this one side. I've actually cut myself <laughs> this one, but it's kind of a sentimental one. I don't use it as much as I used to, but it's, let's see, it says Blick, well, made in Japan. It's number 244241, whatever that means. That's why it's really hard for me to buy them online because I think you have to really see the actual size of it. Unless they show you it and scale with something, it kind of means nothing when you see a picture of it online. You know, you, if I see it in a store, then I'll know, okay, that's the size I want. Any other questions? Question, Anne. Is yeah. the is the board able to handle the pallet knife better than a canvas wood? Would a palace's flexibility cause a problem with your mark making? Yes. Thank you for asking that question. That's one of the reasons I almost exclusively use boards, except for the very large paintings, because Obviously, if you did a large painting and it was bored, it would be very heavy. Um, and expensive. I, and expensive, yes. Um, but if I'm using a canvas, it's very bouncy with the palette knife. And probably very easy to stick your knife through it too, <laughs> accidentally. But yeah, I definitely prefer the board with the palette knife. Yep. And I like a little bit of a texture on it. Um, I, I bought some recently from Jerry's Artorama that's a very ultra smooth texture. I didn't like it. I like to have a little bit of a tooth. It sounds like it does when you're using the knife. It sounds, the sound we're hearing is like a texture surface. Yeah, this one has a little bit of a texture, texture to it. It's almost like too, when you have a too smooth of a texture, it's almost, um, Flip and slide all over the place. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And do you use brushes ever? Do you combine them? I don't. Um, the only time I use a brush is when I put on my orange background. Oh, okay. Uh, that's why I have, uh, that's what this one brush is for right here. <laughs> It's my one brush. Wow. All right. I know. And um, I don't know why. I think I just, uh, I think what I, one of the reasons I really liked palette knife painting in the beginning is I don't have to worry about having a solvent or anything like that or cleaning brushes. I just, I really like to be able to just, you know, go like this and my knife is clean. And uh, yeah. I, I, when I went to school, I did 
I took, uh, you know, oil painting. And I remember always struggling trying to keep my colors clean. I think because I was a little lazy with my keeping my brushes clean. So my paintings it tended to look a little muddy because the colors were all mixing together. But I find that by just being able to wipe the knife clean, I can keep the colors looking a little cleaner. Mm -hmm. hmm. I suspect even an expensive palette knife is nowhere near as expensive as brushes are. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, these are probably, I don't know, $8 around there. Your kitty cat was very cute. <laughs> well, she was walking on my pastel, so I had to interest <laughs> her in something else. We're sitting in my living room slash studio, and she's not a good studio cat at all. <laughs> Does she like to step step all over your artwork? Fortunate, well, the the pastels that are in a tray, but fortunately the cover was on, so we're safe. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I didn't get to finish for you today, but uh, hopefully you got an idea of kind of how I work. My, my suggestion, I, I, you know, I, I love to give people suggestions. <laughs> I would love, the thing I really love about palette knife is the texture. You know, you can walk up to them and you can just look at them at, almost like as a three-dimensional thing. And yep. I would love to be able to get closer to your work so that I could see the strokes. Yeah. I, I, that's the, that's the only problem I'm, I'm having is that I would, I'd, I'd almost have to be on top of it, I guess. Yeah. You know, it's very it's almost like being at a museum and wanting to, you know, having the guards yelling at me that I'm too <laughs> close. You know, it's just, I really, I love to see the three-dimensionality of a palette knife painting. That's yeah. it, the big difference. Well, it, yeah, it's the same, like you see a master's work in a book. And then if you actually see that painting in the museum, it's completely different. It exactly. just, is, it's a whole different experience. Exactly, yep. So we'll be back to demonstrations in person pretty soon. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you can go down to the gallery at Patriot Place and see Anne's work up close and personal too. Yeah, there you go. There you go. And I'm usually always there on Wednesdays too. So if you can't make it on the weekend, oh. I'm usually up there painting on Wednesdays. All right. Oh, good. Good. Well, I really like uh, palette knife. Very nice. You might Is not have finished the owl, but it has a lot of personality already. <laughs> yeah. Is anybody in your group of do you have palette knife painters in your membership? Um, I took your class at the senior center, Anne, and I'm in awe of what you do with that knife. Oh, that's Walter, right? That's, that's correct, that's yeah. Yes, I remember you. You did that beautiful mother and child painting, right? The uh, Water, was it a watercolor you did? A watercolor, yeah, thank you very much. It's gorgeous. Wow, oh, Walter, good. I haven't done it in years. I actually did some palette knife painting in high school and college. Yeah. Um, but I haven't done much painting in a long time for lack of space and or materials. Yeah, that's the hard part. Finding the time and finding the place. My dad um, was an artist and he would uh, teach art down in, he actually taught art in P-Town, uh, oh. Wellfleet in Truro, and a uh, long time ago. And he used a palette knife to make the old, uh, the shanties, the old, you know, cabins that they used to hang all the buoys on. And, and you can imagine a, a palette knife could, was perfect for that. Oh yeah, house, everything hanging and all rough, and and I I can imagine. So that's why I really needed to see the three dimensional side of him. I I can remember him working, but this is beautiful. I love this demonstration. 
Let me see if I can bring it a little closer. See if it makes any difference. Yay. <laughs> oh, wow. See? Oh, oh, nice. Nice. Oh, yeah. Turn them just to the side so the light will get the. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah, I love to see the texture. It's on the other side. Oh, he's beautiful. <laughs> I know. I'm pathetic. I know. <laughs> <laughs> to see the sides thank you very much that's great you're welcome and and that'll dry like that it dries raised oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and the impasto medium helps that too that's cool it helps to give it some structure right right it stays that way that's good yeah even without the background he's he's a striking yeah image He's fierce. <laughs> I think all the, the mice and the little critters need to look out. He's ready to hunt, I think. Right. Might be a female. Does anybody else have any questions for Anne? Dick. Dick all I want to say is- You got to unmute yourself, Dick. You're amazing. <laughs> oh, Anne? Yes. You know what I was what, what I what I was doing as you were painting, and doing a palette. And I I would look away and come back, and he, your owls just come to life. You know, <laughs> it was amazing. No, no, you know, it's kind of like when you're working on something. It's sometimes you have to walk away and come back to it, and yeah. just just doing a little look out, and then looking back, it was like whoa, it came <laughs> to life. Yeah, that's what they tell you, right? Even when you're working, to just step back. Just for yep. a second. Yeah. And often I find that too, if I'm working on a painting and I come back the next day, mm -hmm. what I, sometimes if the painting fairies are nice to you, they'll say, wow, oh, that looks good. Or you know exactly what you need to fix. You like see, oh, I need, that doesn't look right. I need to fix it. So Anne, yes. I have a question. Um, when you are painting your animals, including birds and whatever, do you always start with the eyes? I do. I always start with the eyes. No, we're going to. Okay, there she is. So do you 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 transfer like do you trace them in first and then you work around after you get the eyes in? Yes. Mm-hmm. Because to me. To me, the eyes are almost the most important thing to make sure, especially if I'm doing a pet portrait, mm -hmm. the way the eyes look and then the position with the nose is like the key to getting that pet to look like that pet. So mm -hmm. I always, and it, it, when I'm working on a painting of people, I always do the faces first because it's, it's the most important thing and it's the most difficult. So I wanna make sure I get that down right before I can get to fun stuff <laughs> which is the the yeah. background oh. thank you you're welcome and do you ever use uh, acrylics i did um a while ago and it, it was interesting i i tried it you know with a palette knife and it felt the texture is just so different than oil painting the texture to me feels very plasticky if you use um, acrylic's very thick, kind of feel, has a little bit of a plastic feel to it. Plus it dries so fast mm. that for me, it's hard to kind of keep working things. Mm. Um, you know, like right now, I know this, a lot of this is still wet. And so I can go in and keep sort of manipulating things. But if this was acrylic, I bet most of this would be dry. Mm. But I tried to go back in. And it's really hard to do that if it's if you're trying to do layers and if you've already painted it real thick, it's hard to paint on top of thick acrylic. But I have done little like little quick little small ones, you know, little, you know, maybe five by five, four by four. If I can do, I can do small in acrylic if I, especially if I want it to be to dry. But there's nothing that beats the texture of the oil painting. <laughs> What what uh, what kind of oils do you use, uh, Ian? Do you different diff you mean diff the brand? Yeah, different uh, brands, or do you have a favorite, or what? 
different brands here. Um, I let's see if you can. Um, um, Gamblin. Um, some I've got uh, Windsor Newton. But I'm not like really brand loyal. I like to kind of try around. Sometimes I've used um, Winton. Sometimes, which is a little less. Ex I like this Winton white. It's a mixture. It's a mixture of uh, titanium and zinc. I think it's called soft mixing white. I've been using that. Um, oh, and just some of the favorite colors I have. There's Gamblin makes a warm white, which is really nice. <clears throat> um, rather than using, you know, a bright white with titanium. That this has a little bit of a color to it, especially if I'm doing skin tones. You're is kind of that, like, that's like a parchment color. Yeah. Yeah, because I have part. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, so you're kind of starting out already sort of warm on the warm end. This is another favorite color, phthalo turquoise. This, if you add this oh, white. Yeah, I love the turquoise. Yeah. yeah it makes a very pretty watercolor. Yeah. And I've, I've tried some Rembrandt ones too. Here's a Rembrandt. This makes a nice pink color, carmine. Mm -hmm. This makes a nice pink. So, you know, different kinds and all over the place. So when you set up your palette, do you set up just the colors you think you're going to need to mix, you know, to get the color that you want? Or do you set up your palette with like every color available? I so don't. Cool. I, I set up every color I have. And one of the reasons I do that is I like to mix colors. Mm -hmm. and if I, I find if I don't have all of my colors available, I don't get as interesting combinations as I would. Because sometimes I'll just like, I wonder what happened if I added a little red to this, you know? And yeah. I'm surprised that how a little bit of, of cad red can just really warm up a color. Um, so I like to have all the colors available. So do you put your colors in the freezer uh, until you're going to use them again? I don't. No, I've heard that trick. <laughs> I've heard that trick before, but I haven't done it. Oh. I just the, I put it in the, the Masterson's uh, Stay With Palette. Yeah, and well, I, yeah, yeah, I, I have yeah. those, but I, it, I, the, the wet palettes I usually have for just acrylics, but I put my oils in the freezer and I yeah. find it, I find they work pretty well for me. Yeah. But everybody has their preference. And no one tries to eat it as dessert. <laughs> <laughs> well, a few times I found oil paint in my food, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I agree with that. I think it's very interesting that if you put it in the freezer, it helps to keep them from drying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I do cover it now that I've learned not to get it in my food, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, life is trial and error, you know. That's right. <laughs>